To the John Neighbor Show here live from Natty State Sports Studios. Appreciate each and every one of you listening in and watching in on this beautiful day here in the great state of Arkansas. I am your host, John Neighbors, and appreciate each and every one of you for listening in and watching in this afternoon. As we have a lot of things to get to here on a Monday, we're going to react to everything that happened over the sports weekend, which was quite a bit, especially in the college basketball side of things. So we'll get into that, some NCAA tournament talk. But uh, we'll also be having some Razorback baseball to discuss as they take care of business and win their second SEC series over Auburn, but it didn't come easy. We'll have some Razorback football to get into, resuming spring practice tomorrow morning, actually. Well, at least resuming it for what we'll get to watch. But uh, we'll talk about some things that we want to look forward to and also want to remind everybody that, uh, once again, we are doing phone lines. So, yes, you can call in. I can't believe I did this. I don't know why I did this, but it's happening. So uh, if you want to call in on the conversation and we'll try to connect with you, it's 936-24-NATTY or 936-24-62889 if you want to do it that way too. But yeah, you can just figure it out. We'll uh, we'll open the phone lines for you if you want to get on the conversation there. You can get to the chat too uh, to make that happen. But no matter what it is, we're going to be uh, making it happen all today. But for those of you who are joining in and you see the opening headline here, for Razorback basketball is the conversation just like it has been for the past few days and you know it's not even about the the transfer portal as much even though there's a lot of movement on there too and the pot at the palace there for United States sports has been doing a great job of keeping up with it but it's still about Muss you know it's still about Muss and, and whether or not Muss is staying or going because when we talked on Friday there was a connection or at least a, a report, a little story asking or putting it out there that Eric Musselman to SMU or SMU is interested in Eric Musselman. Uh, are the possibilities there? What could happen? How could it happen? Why would it happen? You know, all, all the questions get surrounded by it. And I remember ending the show on Friday and I was saying, you know, we'll, we'll have an answer, you know, one way or the other. Like here soon, because now that it's kind of out there, we'll have an answer. Well, we haven't not in the direct way at least there has been no sort of statement no sort of contract extension or renegotiation uh, anything like that what it's pretty much been is just the same thing we've been dealing with the last week and a half or so is Eric Musselman staying or is Eric Musselman going the ultimate question but I believe now you're starting to see some of the things going on behind the scenes and also with recruiting in the transfer portal that may provide some reason to believe that Eric Musselman will indeed stay at Arkansas. There are times where we as fans or we in the media like to just get the answer. We don't want to deal with the labor pains. We just want the baby. We want it here. We want it now. And if we don't get it, then we're going to speculate. We're going to whine. We're going to complain. It's just what we do. But the thing with this whole deal with Muss is that when you're looking for answers, when you have questions and you're looking for answers and you're not getting any direct answers, you start to look towards the surrounding deals. You start to look towards the situation within itself and say, all right, well, if we're not going to hear it from the horse's mouth, then let's start trying to put some of the pieces together to make us give an indication of whether or not one thing's going to be happening or the other. And if you look at what's been going on in the transfer portal, and which I hope you do, again, checking out NightStateSports.com and uh, keeping up with the portal tracker, you will notice that Arkansas has not only been contacting particular transfer portal individuals, but setting up visits, campus visits, in-home visits, however visits, Zoom visits, whatever you want to say, but setting up visits for these particular players. Now, some of you may look at it and say, well, what's the big deal? Uh, of course, they're going to keep recruiting or keep coaching, so why not? Why wouldn't they uh, be setting it up? He could be setting it up for the next place he's going to be at. 
And normally I would say that could be a possibility, but because of actually having visits, like legitimate visits on campus at the University of Arkansas, that's a different thing. It'd be one thing if it was just a contact or an, or an interview, but when you're setting it up and going through the work of on-campus visits, that's a whole other animal. People may not realize this, but on-campus visits are extremely difficult to be able to nail down because they're vital and crucial and important to recruiting, and you don't usually just offer those types of opportunities to just anybody. Like Those are the ones that you want on your team if they're coming here on a visit. But setting it up with the player and the individual to do it around a time frame that they're flexible, to do it around a time frame where you're going to be flexible and you're going to have people on campus to be flexible for it, putting in the work, paying the money, all these things, it's a pretty important but also a pretty timely process. So to go through all of it to have official visits is not just something you willy-nilly do. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, and it is crucial to being able to have those types of players play for your team next year or whenever by getting those visits. So Arkansas going to this much length of trying to do whatever it takes to make it happen, to make it to where these guys are coming to campus, gives the indication, or at least has the signs pointing to, that Eric Musselman is staying at Arkansas. A lot of things can change. This has been a weird time, weird year, for many different reasons. And communication, I think, would be the utmost annoyance, or lack thereof, and the fact that you haven't really known or we haven't known what the crap is going on most of the time. We don't know why Devo Davis left the team. We don't know why this team has not been playing well. We don't know why they haven't been playing together. We don't know about players being academically ineligible or focusing on them. Like, we don't know. We have had no indication on anything. And then when the latest comes out about you know the, the possibilities of must leaving or going to another job, we still don't know anything. One day we hear that it's like, oh, it's a, it's a foregone conclusion. He's gone. And then the next day we hear it's like, well, actually, looks like he might be staying. Oh, he was interested in this job, but this job opened up. And then he didn't, didn't then this job got filled. So therefore, he's not interested anymore. It was just a, it was a very exhausting and very frustrating time to try and decipher what all this crap truly means. Because that's what we do. You want to hear about what everyone's talking about in the state of Arkansas and what Razorback fans are talking about. Well, this has been it. This has been on the forefront of people's minds right now is about the status of Eric Musselman. So even though one day we have come out or I've come out here on this show and said, man, I feel like he might be gone. But then next day or two, I come back and I say, well, it looks like he might be staying. It's not because I'm being wishy-washy for the sake of being wishy-washy or I'm doing some ESPN first take stuff and just trying to do the clickbaits to try to get you in and just be like, ah, I can't make up my mind because I don't know what I'm talking about. Like there's been a lot of stuff that's been transpiring and for what you hear from trusted sources to where it's very muddy waters. And I think that's done intentionally, especially by Eric Musselman. We talk about how calculated he is and has been since he's been at Arkansas, whether it's in recruiting, transfer portal, coaching searches, whatever. There has always been an element of surprise, but also misdirection. There, you look over here, and then boom, right over here is where it actually takes place. There's been nothing but that, it feels like, since Eric Musselman has been here at Arkansas. And that's not a bad thing. It's like it's not a knock on him. It's just people operate that way. But since there's nothing but these visits going on, I feel like he's staying. Now, what will be the telltale sign, and I really wish, just for the sake of all of our heart rates and blood pressure, this would happen this week, but what would be the telltale sign is if that you actually get a commitment from a transfer portal player, especially one of the ones that they really want. If you're able to get one of those commitments, I believe that that pretty much solidifies the fact that Eric Musselman's staying at Arkansas. You just got to put the pieces together. It's like hands on Gretel. You just got to keep following the trail and then once you actually get the, the player coming to Arkansas to play here on this campus next season, that's when you start to get an idea of like, okay, this is, this, is, this is real, it's legit, he's staying. But what a whirlwind. What a, what a frustrating and annoying whirlwind that Razorback fans and even all of us have kind of been going through over the past week and a half, two weeks. And it, it's it's not anything that we've conjured up. It's, it's had legitimate reasons to believe one way or the other. 
But I, I, I just like for it to end. <laughs> I'd like for it to at least that part of it come to an end. Because as of right now, you only have four players from last year's team still remaining on the team as we speak. And that, of course, is Tremont Mark, Trevin Brazil, Caleb Battle, and Bayfall. One is not like the others in that, but Bayfall is still technically on the team. And then you have the two incoming freshmen. So that's six players that, as of right now, are still committed and still playing and going to be planning on playing for Arkansas next season. So you're talking about roughly seven additional scholarships that you have open. You're very flexible. You're, you're very open, and you got so many different options to choose from because each and every day, if you follow Joe Tipton, who is on top of all of it, if you follow him, you'll see the madness that surrounds the transfer portal and how insane it is each and every day, each and every hour, multiple boom, 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 boom. So many players entering in. It's almost hard to keep up with. And I don't know how Curtis and Scotty do it, but it is difficult to keep up with. And we know we, we do it the best we can. It doesn't always mean it's going to happen that way, but we do what we can to try to understand and try to make it work. But the point is, is that this particular team in this particular year was not good. And we all want to see change. I want to see change. And I want to see it with Eric Musselman, with, with him being the guy, being on the team, on staff, to be the head coach. I want to see what he can do and what he's capable of. You know, we said at the end of the season, at the end of postseason play, when Arkansas's year came to an end against Mrs., uh, South Carolina, I should say, he talked about in the press conference afterwards that he's never been more motivated. He's never been more motivated to get out there and to get back to winning. He's never been more motivated. And at the time, I'm like, I like hearing that, but because of the uncertainty, is it true? Well, now I believe it is true. I believe Muss is motivated. I believe that he's going to be the coach of Arkansas, and I want him to be the coach of Arkansas. And I want to see what a motivated Muss looks like after having his back against the wall. He's never experienced anything like he experienced this past year, at least in the college ranks. He's never had a year that was just disastrous and terrible, losing record, embarrassing losses, getting trounced. Like there was never a time he's had to deal with this. So now that he has, how does he respond? It's going to be about the ultimate response. Arkansas has to get back to the NCAA tournament. Honestly, the SEC better hope they get back because it seems like our, the SEC is the only team worth carrying the load for these other teams because, boy, it's been terrible for this conference in the uh, NCAA tournament. But it goes back to still some of you may have been upset about the way it was going on with Muss. You don't want you wanted to move on or you're just like, hey, let's 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 get rid of this guy or whatever you wanted. Like, I'm not saying everybody was that way, but there were a lot of people that just wanted to move on from it. I want to remind all of you of, of a few things real quick. Eric Musman, as we know, since he arrived on campus, is eight and three in the NCAA tournament. He didn't make the tournament this year, but he's eight and three in the NCAA tournament. Rick Barnes, in that same span, he would have to win the national championship this year to surpass Eric Musselman in wins over that same span. He'd have to win the national championship this season to get to nine NCAA tournament wins. He's five and three. Nate Oates would have to do the same exact thing. Win the national championship to surpass Eric Musselman in NCAA tournament wins in the same span. And those are the second best coaches of the NCAA tournament records in the SEC during that time. Bruce Pearl's two and three in that same span. Buzz Williams is one and two in that same span. John Calipari of Kentucky, one and three in that same span. This is the coach that Arkansas wants to have, and that's the coach I want to have. Because if you want to really take it to another level and looking at Oates and Barnes, let's say they win, lose these Sweet 16 matchups, which knowing those two coaches, you never can put it too far past them. They're not very great in the postseason. But say if they got eliminated after this Sweet 16 appearance that they're going through right now. It would still take a season or two of Arkansas not making postseason play 
and them actually winning games in the tournament at a more effective rate to surpass Muss. I'm saying all that simply to say that you don't realize just how good you got at Razorback fans with Eric Musselman as your coach. Yes, this year was bad. Yes, it shouldn't happen again. Yes, there was high expectations and it was met with a disastrous season. There's no denying that. And I don't think Eric Musselman himself would ever, ever deny that himself. But you still got, according to the numbers, the best NCAA tournament coach in this league. And as of right now, it's not really close. I mean, you're talking about, again, Oates and Barnes have to have three, NC, three more NCAA tournament wins in this tournament to tie what Eric Musselman's done. Remember that and be thankful for it. I'm glad that it looks as if Eric Musselman's remaining on as coach. That's what I wanted. And I'm hoping that's what all you Razorback fans wanted. He's not above criticism, but you should want to have a man like that in position as your head coach. I know that they didn't do anything in, in March this year, too. But y'all can't deny the fact either that Arkansas, for, for all their problems, they were playing their best basketball at the end of the season. It was still wasn't good. Still wasn't great basketball. But they were playing their best basketball at the end of the season. I think about what we saw from last night in Texas A&M and Houston. That game went to overtime, an insane game. Arkansas swept those Aggies. I think about Alabama. You know, they're in the Sweet 16. And uh, they, they had all that they wanted to handle from Grand Canyon. But they're in the Sweet 16 nonetheless. That was a team that Arkansas had dead to rights and should have won the game. They didn't. So you can't say that they did. But still, those are two of the teams in the SEC that – are still in the NCAA tournament and or at least got close to moving on into the NCAA tournament and Arkansas either beat them or held their own against them and should have beaten them. That was at the end of the season. Like you played your best basketball at the end of the year. He's still built for March, Eric Musselman is. He's still built for it. He's still built for postseason. He always has ways of finding the ways to make his team play their best at the end of the regular season heading into postseason play. This next season is going to be a crucial, pivotal year to make sure you get the right guys in place. Keep the right guys that you want and build around them because if there is any sort of way that Arkansas and Eric Musselman puts together a, a team that we've seen must be capable of, whether it was the 2021 or the 2022 team, that team that finished in the top four of the SEC a team that made it to the Elite Eight, like if they can form together another team that is that talented and that skilled enough, then I'm going to feel great about heading into March. I'm going to feel great about heading into the NCAA tournament. Because another thing you got to understand too, folks, that eight and three record, that also includes two wins over number one seeds in the NCAA tournament. And those are two things that Tennessee and Alabama, their coaches, they don't have. So always be careful what you wish for, but remember, Muss is the guy. Muss is the man. And I am very happy to be feeling good about the chances of him returning to the Razorback basketball team next season. We'll get to a lot of your comments, folks. Again, if you want to call in here on the show, it's 936-24-NATTY. It's 936-24-NATTY. As uh, we've just been talking about Eric Musselman, What'd you th what do you think about... Him coming back next season, is that what you want? Is it, it going to come with some stipulations on your end? You're like, yeah, you can come back, Musk, but this is what we want. This is what we're going to have to have. This is what we're going to need if we want to be able to believe in you. Is that is that the case? Well, let us know by calling in at 936-24-NATTY, which, by the way, when you do call in, folks, uh, it's just going to ask you what's your name, where you're calling from, what you want to talk about. You press pound. And the rest is is taken care of. So just just a heads up for those of you who may not be aware of that. Uh, let's go ahead and go to some of these comments too. Got uh, random stuff saying it's wild to me that when everyone wanted Pittman gone, the university shared everything with us. But when everyone wants Must to stay, we hear almost nothing. Well, I mean, because I, I again, it's a different coach, different animal. Like Must is a control freak, psychopath, 
in a very positive way. Like it, it can be what drives him. Like those, the, the success that he has is based upon him being the way he is. He has, he's very demanding. He has a high expectation. He can be tough to work with. He can be tough to play for at times, but the results are there. And so you're going to have all of that controlled by Eric Musselman. Where, when the Pittman side of things, and I'm not meaning this as an insult, Pittman doesn't give the vibes of being a control freak or a psychopath, where it's like, I got to control everything. I got to control my narrative. I got to control, like, it's just this, this, this. In fact, if anything, Sam Pittman's been more of a overly honest, too honest at times, and too upfront and too communicative. So I think that that's a big part of it is just the approach, you know, because also, too, Eric Musselman, as I brought up, 8-3 and three in NCAA tournament games. Sam Pittman, I mean, he had one really good year, and that's been it. I mean, it's been fine at times. Like, 7-6 and six is fine. When they went 3-7 and seven in the COVID year, that was fine, especially considering where he came from. But I think that that's a, I think that's a big part of it is, is it's different. Um, I, I think it's just a different animal from all of that too so but yes i i get what you're saying though random stuff uh let's see braden wood says i think it's time to turn the page from us leaving it's now time to let the importer do his thing and get excited for all the changes he's going to make going into next year i'm with you on that i, I think it is time to unless something legitimate comes out like of any sort of note i'm just going to go ahead and be like all right he's here he's staying he's the guy and let's see what the portal has going in fact Curtis and Scotty have been putting up pot at the palaces pretty much every day, trying to keep everybody updated with that. So uh, if you haven't, uh, be sure to check it out too. And uh, Four Holmes, or Horns, excuse me, says, you can't have drama in the locker room. I think Muss is making changes to eliminate those players and focus on others who want to play and be a Razorback. I think so. I think that there's an element to where, you know, like Devo Davis moving on. I'm not calling him out by name, but – He's been around the program for so long that maybe it's just time for a change. It's kind of like the whole KJ Jefferson thing. It's like, it's not that you're a bad player. It's not that you're a bad person. It's not that you're horrible or whatever. So I think a lot of it is just kind of like, hey, you know, we, we, need, a, we need a fresh start, a, 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 a fresh look of everything. And that's okay. Like a lot of people do that and that's okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. And old Smiles Outdoors says, I'm happy that Musa Stang is going to turn around the team and they'll be making a tournament run. Go Hogs. I think that's what everyone's hoping for. Uh, I think that's what everyone's hoping for. So, uh, all right. I, I, this, this caller's from Little Rock. We're going to go ahead and try this out. And this, I'm sure it'll work really well. So, uh, some from the 501. So, let's go ahead and get him in. Uh, what's up, caller from Little Hello. Rock? Hello. Hello. Um, did you see that Carius Kern de decommitted? Yeah, sure did. Sure did. We were going to talk about that in your Arkansas updates. Uh, but, yeah, the throws don't know the, the big time uh, – Razor or in state recruit, the four star player, defensive lineman from, uh, I believe, I'm trying to remember where he was from, but uh, he's, a, he's a big time player that Arkansas football is counting on. But yes, he reopened his commitment today, which is an in, is in essence of him uh, decommitting. But yeah, he's from Marion. But yes, I did hear about that. I was wondering if you think that Pittman also is kind of just trying to, isn't really recruiting the in state guys, kind of similar to Mus as much as. He could. Yeah, well, I, I tell you what, we can talk about that. Appreciate the phone call, caller from Little Rock. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that the the way that Pittman has done and recruited in state uh, has, has kind of fallen off a little bit as far as the big time commitments, and there can be some reasons behind that. Uh, I don't think that there's anything that people pro probably you're going to look at as like, oh, well, it's an NIO, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. Eh, well, a lot of it's just because you've been losing. And, you know, Pittman did a really good job of uh, recruiting the in-state kids uh, in the beginning part of when he arrived on campus. It seemed like most of the major players that you wanted from the state of Arkansas were coming to Arkansas. They committed to Arkansas. Not all of them have panned out in, in a big way, but uh, he was able to, to get a lot of them. But, you know, it's, it's kind of getting to the point to where you got to start winning. And if you're not winning and there are other programs that are winning – they want to be a part of that. Or maybe you do get offered a lot more NIL if uh, you're an incoming freshman from some other school. Because from what I understand is Carrius Kern had an offer pretty much to anywhere he wanted to go. So there's a lot of there's a lot of elements to it. But I look at it in football a little bit differently because high school recruiting 
it matters, but it doesn't matter as much to me personally. I'm more about the transfer portal in football, especially this year and probably even the next season. Like, yes, you got to have some high school players. I'm not saying you don't. But when it comes to you having the success that you need to have as a program, that portal is what's most important. I mean, how often are you going to see true freshmen step right in and not only contribute and, and play, but be huge impacts on your team in a positive way? I mean, the, the odds of those, those types of players happening are pretty few and far between. You know, you even think back to last season. I mean, you had Lucas, who was phenomenal, but he got hurt. And then on, on top of that, I mean, what are you looking at? Jalen Braxton, probably. But you just didn't have a lot of freshmen. But you did have transfers. You know, in Arkansas, they've had a lot of uh, success in getting some, some portal guys. Not everybody's been a hit, but they've had some success getting some portal guys. And when they have, it's, it's panned out and it's made a big difference on the team. But, you know, having true freshmen, it's just not always going to be the case. It's not always just going to work out perfectly. So uh, I get what you're saying, but who knows? There's, there's players out there, and I'm not saying Kearns like this, but there are some players that, you know, maybe highly rated, highly regarded coming out of high school especially out of the state of Arkansas, and then they get to college and you never hear from them again. I'm not saying I'll have them Kern. For all I know, Kern could be the next All-American. But I would take my chances and roll the dice a lot more with transfer portal guys than I would incoming freshmen is, is basically what I'm saying. So but appreciate the phone call, though. Uh, let's see. There's a few other people here in the chat uh, that wanted to uh, bring in and talking about Razorback basketball. Uh, Northeast Hawk fan says, after this past weekend, Greg saying he needs to be hoping that Musk comes back to the NCAA tournament too. Yeah, you think? What a pathetic showing by the SEC. I, I mean, I wasn't expecting a whole lot because we even talked about it. The conference wasn't that great heading into this year or heading into this postseason at least. Tennessee was really good. Auburn was solid. Bama was solid. Kentucky was solid. But there wasn't anything about them where like, oh, man, Final Four type of team for sure. And Tennessee was really the only one that I felt good enough about getting to the Final Four. Maybe they won a national championship. That would still take a lot. But I would have never expected to see the early exits from Kentucky like it was or Auburn like it was. Um, I was more surprised that A&M won a game in the NCAA tournament and gave Houston all they wanted last night. More so than anything, but yeah, the, the conference has not been great. It has not been great. And so if Tennessee, I really kind of hope Tennessee and Alabama lose this upcoming weekend just so I can troll any other SEC fan bases and be like, well, I see you still can't make it as far as Arkansas and Eric Musselman. Yep, they weren't there. You're right. Yeah, Arkansas wasn't there. It sucked. It was a, it was a crappy year, but. Man, you guys really, the SEC really needs Arkansas to step in and start winning some games in the tournament because apparently y'all don't know how to. That would just be the way I would approach it. But uh, let's see. That Rickster says, I've been hearing from around my way that the in-states fear not getting to play over those transfers and out-of-state talent. Winning does play the other part. I mean, maybe so, dude. Like Every single player in high school, recruit, transfer portal, they all want a different thing. I'd say the majority of them are about NIL and what they can get paid. But for like there's different wants and needs. There's there's been, I mean, you guys have seen this even before NIL played a factor. There were players that were coming out of the state of Arkansas. They're like, I don't care if Mayor McCheese was the head coach. I'm coming to Arkansas because I'm going to be a Razorback. Like that's how Darren McFadden was. That's how Bobby Portis was. Like they wouldn't have cared who the coach was or what was going on. They were coming to Arkansas. And then there were other players that you had to really work at and really get after and really make some moves in the recruiting process to convince them to come to your school. Like every player is different. Every individual is different. So, I mean, would it surprise me if there are some players out there that may not feel great as an in-state kid going into Arkansas? Maybe, but that I don't know. That feels like a really dumb thing to be concerned about. No offense, but like if you're concerned about – not playing over transfers? Well, yeah, of course. Like, tran That's the way every place is going to be. Like, Find me a school, find me a major football program right now that freshmen are walking into and playing and, and being contributors and being a difference maker. Like very few. You think Michigan? Like, Look at their roster last year and see how many true freshmen were huge contributors. It's very doubtful. So 
doesn't matter if you're in state or out of state. If you're a freshman, odds are you're not going to just walk into a school and be playing immediately. You can contribute maybe. Also depends on the position you're at. But I mean, look at the transfer portal right now. Uh, like the team guys that we feel like are going to play this year for Arkansas. Look at the offense alone. Taylor Green's your starting quarterback. You're going to have two new starting offensive linemen that are transfers, Addison Nichols and Carmona. Um, you're going to have some guys contribute in the running back position, like uh, I believe it's Jaquin, Jaquindon Williams. I always get his name wrong. But uh, the Utah transfer, like he's going to be a big factor in this team. So, yeah, it, it's just it's part of it, and, and it's the way football is now, and I'm okay with it. Like I'm not bummed that football has become this, but it's still just – it's the way it is. Uh, I don't. And here's another thing. I don't care where you're from. I do not give a rip if you're from the state of Arkansas. If you are and you come to Arkansas and you're great and you love the Razorbacks, that is awesome. And maybe they mean a little bit more after they're gone. But I just want you to play. I just want players. I want dudes. I don't care where you're from. In-state, out-of-state, does not matter. Think about how many great players have come through football, basketball, baseball that were not from the state of Arkansas when they had some of their most magical seasons. I mean, look at the, look, look at Arkansas when they won the national championship in 1994. How many in-state players did they have that contributed on that team? Like Corliss was obviously a big one, but most of them weren't from the state. Think about football. Some of the greatest players you've had, yeah, have been from Arkansas, but there's been a lot of other great players that were not from Arkansas. Some of your best defensive players you've had over the past 10, 15 years we're not from Arkansas. Think about Trey Flowers. Think about Dietrich Wise, Martrell Spate, Darius Phylon. Now, those guys weren't, weren't from the state of Arkansas. Look at Landon Jackson, what he's going to do this year. He's not from the state of Arkansas. So it's just you, you can't always just look at it so simply. Sometimes it's just getting the best players to play. That's what you want. Jessica says, I want Musk back without the favoritism. Devo should not have been playing 40 minutes a game, and Lawson should not have started over Mitchell. Well, here's the thing, Jessica, I, I, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, I, I, I just trust Muss. You know, I, I don't think Muss is to the point of where he's, I don't think he's showing favoritism because the dude wants to win. You know what I'm saying? He's never shown favoritism before, and I don't think he's going to start now. I don't think he was playing Devo just because he's like, well, this guy's better, but Devo's my guy. I, there wasn't any of that. Muss is wired and built and only caring about winning. And the reason you kept seeing the starting lineup change so much is I think is very vindictive of that. Like if, if it was just simply wanting to play these players, he would have not changed the lineup as much as he did. But he did because he wanted different guys to see if it would click, see if it would come together. So take that into consideration too. I get what you're saying, but there's still a lot of, of things that you know, go into it that maybe even I don't even realize. But I trust Muss because he's gained that benefit from me. Dude's done great things at Arkansas. This was a bad year, no doubt, but he's, he's he's deserving of a little grace and a little credit for what he's been able to do. So, But uh, keep those uh, comments coming, folks. And again, if you want to get on the phone lines and hear your, uh, hear your voice on this show, because I know you all want to, just call in at 936-24-NATTY. That's 936-246-2889. And we'll get to more of that. But before we get to all that, folks, got to tell you about one of our favorite sponsors here on the show. It is Signature Bank here in the state of Arkansas. They're privately held and a boutique bank that's redefining the banking experience in our entire region here in Arkansas. They blend the warmth and familiarity of a community bank with other sophistication. And also they have it, the sophistication of a commercial bank and the expertise of private banking to deliver unmatched levels of service. The thing that's, there's many things I love about Signature Bank, but the real thing that I love about them is that they're always personally invested. They take an approach to your banking like a concierge, offering personalized solutions that go beyond your expectations, things you don't even think of that you could be using or that could be helpful to you, and they take it above and beyond. They remove the friction of banking from their products and services to easy to understand and all the access that they offer. You have business goals that you're trying to solve, and they have banking products that answer those issues so they can help take care of what's important in life which of course is your money your business your home and your kids that's what you get with signature banking and they have locations all across the state of arkansas so check them out today you can also visit their website at www.signature.bank that's www.signature.bank and they'll give you all the details of why they are 
the best bank to, you could choose from here in the state of Arkansas and why they're the official bank of Natty State Sports here in Arkansas. So check them out today. It's Signature Bank. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll get to more of your phone calls and your messages, as well as get into some Razorback baseball talk and even some football talk. So stay with us here on the John Neighbor Show, live from Natty State Sports Studios. We're not done yet either. So don't be satisfied. We're not done. I mean, honestly, I don't really remember post game. I guess I black out after games, winning and losing. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Just tell me you missed it. I'm not going to go there with you. Why not? And that will be the last question I answer with that hat on. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shoot. That is why Arkansas is fantastic. Yes, sir. You know, and, and I like, you know, I didn't like the game, but I'm glad I was able to walk off the floor again and deep inside and have that funny feeling that, hey, one more time, Horn. Best guys, uh, I know it's a tough time for you. Uh, the coach is gone, but you got a new coach now, and you got to listen to what he says. Okay, I know you're thinking, oh, who is this new guy? Where's the other guy that crashed the motorcycle? We like him better. He was cool or whatever. Forget about all that. Listen to the new coach and get out there and win some games. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. You guys act like it's... Pick it up a little bit, okay? Get your chin up. Smile. Smile. Okay? Dang, you guys all right? If not, I'm not talking. I'm so excited. Oh, oh. Guys, I've got just one thing I want to say to you. Touchdown, Arkansas! I was a teacher today. Told those boys, welcome to the SEC. Fayetteville is 1,843 miles away, but the call of the Hawks can be heard all the way. San Francisco. Let's take my dick in the mashed potato. Go Hawks. Powered by Arkansas for Arkansas. Every time you put a mic in my face, I'm going to say Arkansas. The John Neighbors Show is live from the Natty State Sports Studios. And welcome back in to the John Neighbors Show here from Natty State Sports Studios. Appreciate everybody listening in and watching in on this beautiful day here in the great state of Arkansas. I'm your host, John Neighbors, and thank you for making us a part of your afternoon this afternoon, as uh, we'll get to more of your uh, phone calls and messages and also uh, talk about some uh, Razorback football and baseball, because I know that that's something that's on everybody's mind as well. But before we do, I want to tell you about one of our newest advertisers here on the John Neighbor Show. It is Autograph, and you can download the Autograph app on your iPhone or your Android. It's a company that is co-founded by Tom Brady, and what they want to do is they want to level up the experience of all you fans where it comes to podcasts, when it comes to written content, when it comes to everything, you can check it out with the Autograph app and specifically your team. And when you are able to consume that media content through Autograph, you're going to level up your own experience that leads to extra rewards. And that's what makes the Autograph app so incredible is that if you just download it and use promo code Natty in A-T-T-Y, download the app and use promo code Natty in A-T-T-Y, You'll be able to see exactly the type of rewards that you'll get and the type of media that you're going to be able to consume, and you're going to get rewarded for it. So download the app today and get started with being rewarded with all the things that you already do as a fan, like reading news, listening and watching college basketball coverage, and attending events. It's really that simple. So download the Autograph app today at link.ag.fan slash natty, or just go to the iPhone or your Android app store and download the Autograph app and use promo code Natty. It's as simple as that. Again, appreciate everybody uh, listening in this afternoon as uh, we've been uh, talking a little bit about Razorback basketball and Eric Musselman, and it looks like he's staying. That's really what it came down to. It looks like he's staying, and I'm fine with it. I'm happy for it. I'm thankful for it even. But uh, a few more of your comments, though, before we uh, move on to uh, some Razorback baseball talk because there's plenty to talk about there. Uh, Hunter says, uh, NIL can make it harder to know which out-of-state guys are truly buying into Arkansas. You know, NIL can make pretty much everything more difficult. In fact, it has made everything more difficult. Now, it's not to say that it doesn't have positives. 
because it does. Like, I've always been in favor of having players be able to make money off their name, image, and likeness. But it has complicated things, and it's it's got to have some sort of regulation. Like, something has to give. This is insane, and, and it's goes, it goes across all college sports. But, yes, it has made a lot of things more complicated in the, in the landscape of everything. So not just for the out-of-state kids, in-state kids, because in-state kids want money, too. They want money, too. And if they can get – like, cause that's the thing. There are players that are like, I want to go to Arkansas. I want to be a Razorback. That's great, and that's true. But if they're getting $700,000 to go play for Alabama and Arkansas is only giving them $200,000, and they start to be like, you know what? I, I like Ar- I love the Razorbacks. I want to be a Razorback, but that extra $500,000 sounds pretty nice right now. I mean, I think that there could be some, uh, some elements to that, too. Could be some elements there. Uh, geez. Nick Lee says, uh, Bay fall in year two should be ready. Having that UMass player come in for a visit seems like a slap in the face. I listen, I don't care about what the player came from or what their school was at or what their numbers were. I said this last time, I was like, you had great numbers of great players from major programs this last year. And what did it get you? So I, I'm, I'm again, I'm just, I'm, I'm fine. I'm looking at no numbers. Don't look at anything like that. Just get the guys that want to come in and, and, and all that. Like that's, and who can fit what Eric Musselman's trying to do here. That's that's the key. But to be honest, I don't know. They say if Bay Falls on the team next year, which I still would be surprised. But if Bay Falls on the team, I really don't know what people can see from him this past year and say, oh, no, he'll be ready in year two. Like, why? Why do you, why do you think that? I'm not saying he can't be good, but I need to see a little bit more. Because that that guy was completely and totally raw. He he would get lost a lot of times. He he had some issues, and so you know, I, if if Eric Musselman and the team wants to keep him on, then so be it. But I just don't think that he goes from not playing a single time really as a freshman to bam as a sophomore being a major contributor. Because that's even the thing. If you look back with what Eric Musselman's done with with true freshmen here. You kind of get a really early indication on if those guys are going to be contributors and really good players. The first year that Eric Musselman went to the Elite Eight, yeah, Moses Moody was a one-and-done player, but do you remember? Devo Davis and Jalen Williams were not one-and-done players, but they started to find a role on the team as the year went on, and so much so that they were making big plays in the NCAA tournament. That's when you knew that Must trusted them, that they were doing what they were expected to do. They were key contributors, and that's why they kept getting playing time. And really, since that point, you haven't seen many other freshmen that have come in that's been able to do that. You know, you Jordan Walsh, Nick Smith Jr., Anthony Black, like obviously those guys, but again, one-and-done players. But you get, get a pretty good early indication that if they're not playing early as freshmen – probably means that they are far from ready being able to play for Eric Musselman's squad. So just keep that into consideration too. I get what you're saying, but there's a lot of other things where I'm, I'm trusting Muss on that stuff. Like Lane Blocker is a player I would have liked to seen back next year just to see what he could do because he did play more so as a true freshman than I even expected him to. In fact, if before the year started, I felt like, Bayfall may play a little bit more than Layden, but that obviously didn't happen. So I would have liked to have seen him and what he could have developed into, but again, we're not going to have that opportunity, not going to have that chance. Because for those of you who may not know, uh, Layden Blocker entered into the transfer portal. So just keeping you updated on that. Uh, let's Speaking of updates, let's go ahead and jump into your Arkansas update brought to you by Davis and Garrett Insurance, your independent auto owners insurance agency securing what matters the most and for a few things before we get to Razorback baseball from the weekend series uh want to give some updates on what's actually happening here in just a few days or I guess tomorrow because tomorrow Arkansas is playing against Little Rock in Baum Walker Stadium that game has been moved from 6 p.m to 3 p.m due to possible inclement weather it's going to be nasty cold tomorrow like stupid cold I think last time I checked it was like a high of 46 degrees So if any of you go into that game, power to you. But they've moved up that game as of right now to 3 p.m. And also uh, softball, Razorback softball is going to be going up against UCA tomorrow. That game was originally scheduled for 7 p.m. And they've moved it up to 4 p.m. So a few differences there. But 
Hey, shout out to Hagen Smith. He was named SEC Pitcher of the Week, rightfully so, because Hagen is just that dude. Arkansas, we talked about it on Friday, but Arkansas getting the victory over Auburn in game one, one to nothing, was, uh, whew, it's scary. Like, those games are fun, but they're intense where, I mean, one pitch just makes the difference in them, especially a low-scoring game like that. But uh, I hate the fact that he's a co-pitcher of the week, once again. ArkansasRazorbacks.com never puts out the co part of it until you read the article, but everybody else has a co. But yeah, he shared it with Texas AM and pitcher Justin Lampkin. <laughs> but either way, uh, Hagan gets uh, six scoreless innings with 12 strikeouts. It's his fourth double digit strikeout game of the season. Uh, he improves to 4 0 and had his uh, team leading fourth quality start of the year. So they took care of business and he raised his career total to 261 total strikeouts. It's a tie for fourth on Arkansas's all-time career strikeout list. He allowed just three hits and two walks in a dominant outing. And for the season, he's given up a 1.24 ERA and 62 strikeouts in 29 innings and has held his opposing batters to a 116 batting average. That seems pretty good. You know, 116 is not a great batting average, and if you hold your entire opponents to that, that's usually a pretty good thing. So, uh, But congratulations to him and uh, getting SEC Pitcher of the Week. Because, again, he's, if anybody deserves it, uh, that guy definitely deserves it. So there is your Arkansas update brought to you by Davis and Garrett Insurance, your independent auto owner's insurance agency, securing what matters the most. Uh, and speaking of Razorback baseball, you know, they took care of business and they won this series against Auburn. Game one is always crucial and most important. Winning that game one to nothing is really helpful. But then it happened on, fr on Friday, as we discussed, that Dave Van Horn was not going to be in attendance for that Friday game. It came out, it was a personal matter, but what in reality it ended up being was that his daughter, uh, when the laborer was having her triplets, that's right, she's having triplets. So uh, good to hear that everything went well with that and that uh, everything's going fine, that the kids are healthy and everything. But Arkansas was in a tough bout once again on Friday night, and a lot of weirdness happened. Arkansas won 6-5 to five over Auburn, but Auburn was able to, to make some moves and get the game tied at 5, until the top of the ninth inning, uh, Ryder Helfrich, who was not the starter or catcher in the beginning of the game, but moved over to that spot. Well, I'll just let the uh, the call and the video do the talking because this was pretty electric. Helfrick standing in from the right side. The freshman awaits the first pitch with one away. First pitch swinging and belted. Absolutely annihilated. If it's fair, it's gone. It's gone. Ryder Helfrick. He likes his taters mashed. How about the freshman coming through in the top of the ninth with one away and absolutely tanks one over the War Eagle on left. It's now 6-5 Arkansas. Here's the thing about that particular call, which I know Phil Elson wasn't on the call. He was doing a women's basketball for the final time, I believe. Yeah, over the over that point with the SEC tournament. Or the, was it that? Uh, I don't know. There was a reason why Phil Elson wasn't on the call. But... That was a game. That was a run that, like, I don't care who you are. There was no chance that that was even a, a, a discrepancy on whether that ball was gone or not. That was one of the most hardest hit home runs I've seen in a while. Maybe since Jalen Battles, Balls Battles, home run against Louisiana Tech on the road. Um, but I saw that the track man had it at, uh, what was it, 405? No way. That was, what was that? Was that what it was in turn, Will? Yeah, 405? Yeah. Ain't no chance that, that was just 405 feet. That thing went missing. That ball, I mean, that ball probably hadn't even landed yet. So what a big time hit and a big time moment for Ryder Helfrick in that in that situation. Gave Arkansas the lead and shout out to big Will McIntyre coming in and closing it up as he enters into the final inning game on the line and gets two big strikeouts. Uh, one of those being the game ceiling victory for that strikeout and Arkansas takes care of business and wins the series. Just just electric, an absolutely electric game. And uh, again, Ryder Helfer getting that type of play, that type of call is always going to be a lot more fun too. So, uh, but as, as fun as that was, and as fun as a game that was, and it was a great moment, I think Matt Hobbs did a great job. I think he's basically the interim coach during that time, fill-in coach. Uh, I think he did a good job of managing the game, managing the pitchers, managing the field, the, the hitting, obviously, by putting Helfrick in there and uh, really boosted Arkansas that got him the victory. Was a little frustrating, though, because Arkansas was unable to sweep Auburn. They were in position where they probably should have, but they didn't. Uh, not to say that it's a bad weekend or that anybody should look at it with a bad taste in their mouth and nothing like that, but 
Arkansas did lose game three, eight to six. So a little bit of higher scoring game. Both teams had 10 hits. But Arkansas got it going in the early part where they got up four nothing in the fourth inning, top of the fourth inning. Then they gave up a run in the fifth inning, but then they scored again in the sixth inning. So you're talking about up 5-1 heading into the bottom of the sixth inning. You're in great shape. Well, things got really bad. Arkansas gave up six runs in the sixth inning and gave up one more in the eighth, and that was all she wrote. Mason Molina came in and had, had a solid outing, pitched five innings, gave up three hits, only one earned run, had four strikeouts, threw 74 pitches. But Cooper Dossett and Gabe Gackle came in, and oof, it was rough on them. You only had eight pitches thrown by Cooper Dossett. Gave up two hits, two earned runs. He was out. Gabe Gackle, who I've been really high on. I think he's going to be a great player. He comes in, throws 14 pitches, but gives up a hit and three earned runs. And only faced three batters. And then Colin Fisher comes in and, play, and pitches for a little over two innings. Gives up four hits, two earned runs, with only one strikeout. So a little bit of a struggle there for Arkansas from the uh, some of the pitchers in the bullpen. And, again, I want to reiterate, this is not me saying that it's bad, that everything's terrible and this team is, oh, man, that's something to concern. But it, it was something you want to see guys not do that and not be in that position. But these are the moments that are going to help build these teams and build these guys and get their character back because that's really what will separate – you know, good pitchers from great pitchers. We've seen guys, especially in true freshmen, who came into games and struggled. Just struggled. Just did not have it, did not have their stuff. And what's always the most interesting thing to look for is how they bounce back later in the year. Because they're going to get their opportunities again. It's about how do they bounce back later in the year. I'm totally on board with Gabe Gackle. Like, I think he's going to be a great player for Arkansas. There's no concerns I have on that front. But because he had a little bit of a struggle there, how is he going to respond when his number gets called again? Is he going to settle in and get him out? Or is he going to let it get to him? Is it going to get to his head? Is it going to start making him waver a little bit? Because it happens before, and it's not, it's not uncommon. You know, I felt that same way about Gage Wood last year. I remember when he came out in the beginning part of it, when he got his opportunities, he looked really good. Got it going. But then one bad outing led to two bad outings, and he struggled a little bit. Brady Tiger was the same way as a true freshman. I know you all remember that. True freshman coming in, being a closer, and he was throwing smoke, getting it done. And then a couple of bad outings here and there. It's a lot for a true freshman to handle. It's nothing against him. I mean, I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. But it's a lot for a true freshman to handle that way. So, I want to see how those guys respond. I'm, I, Arkansas won the series. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You beat Auburn. That's all that matters. I'm just talking about from specifically the angle of these particular pitchers who have gotten experience and are continuing to, to build towards that. I want to see more out of them. I want to see how they respond. Because you're going to have to count on them. Especially when you get to postseason play. Regionals, especially. World Series. Omaha, especially. I'm not saying it's easy in supers, but it's a three-game series. You know, you kind of have it set in stone there. But when you're talking about double elimination in those regionals and in Omaha, you're going to have to count on a lot of these pitchers. So you know, I just want to see I want to see how they bounce back, and I hope they bounce back really well. I think they will. I think they'll be fine. But isn't it crazy? That's another thing that's so romantic and great about baseball. I... Like, baseball's not my favorite sport, but I respect baseball, and I love watching Razorback baseball, and it's a lot of fun. But isn't that crazy about baseball, though, folks? I mean, you're talking about Arkansas winning a series over Auburn in a game that ended one nothing in game one because of a home run that was hit by Aloy in the first inning, and that was the only score that was made, one nothing, And then you win another game, 6-5, to five, where you needed a absolute piss missile to Neptune from a guy like Helfrich in the top of the ninth to get that victory in one run in a one run game six to five you're I mean you're this close from getting swept <laughs> like that's what's crazy about baseball sometimes especially in these low scoring games to get the victory means everything you didn't play perfect at times sure it wasn't always pretty at times sure 
But to get the victory, to get the series victory, it, it, that's all that matters. I think even Andrew Ellis pointed out that if you look at the scoring from both teams, they were tied. They, they Both teams scored as many runs this past weekend as the other, but only one team got out of there with a serious victory, and that was Arkansas. So game of inches is usually football, but, man, every, every pitch in those types of games matter the most, and that's what separates you being a good team to a great team, finding ways to win. Arkansas only given, getting one run in the first inning. You don't think that they wanted to score more? You don't think that they were in that position to score more? Of course they were. Of course they wanted to be. But they didn't. But they found a way to win. Same thing on Friday. You don't think that they would have liked to have had um, a, a better situation that they walked into, not being tied at five heading into the final inning. You don't think that they didn't want it? Of course they didn't. But guess what? They found a way to win. The, Thursday, the Friday game was also really weird, too, because they had that instance with the umpire behind home plate. I know y'all remember that. I don't think I've ever seen that before, speaking of. The home plate umpire had a foul ball, an, an Auburn baseball uh, uh, hitter hit it foul, and it went right into his mask and knocked him down. Kind of a scary moment, because even though they have protective mask and everything, it still does not mean that it doesn't impact you, it doesn't hurt, or doesn't you know, knock you loopy a little bit. But he got knocked down, and suddenly we had to enter into a delay until a new umpire came in, or the umpire's equipment and, and everything. It was, it was like 30 minutes. And hilariously enough, there on the SEC network, you, know, you see on a little golf cart, here, uh, here he comes. That's the new umpire's music. He's coming out. And, and he came in and, and finished up the game. But those are things you just don't really take into consideration and how crazy it is and how crazy it, it could have been. So luckily... The umpire was okay. I think he ended up being okay, but glad they were able to play the game. But I've never seen that where you had a 25 to 30 minute delay on something like that. That does not happen very often. But Arkansas is now 2 0 in series. They got a big one against LSU coming up this weekend, which LSU this is what I hate. LSU has not won an SEC series yet. They're 0 2 in their SEC series this year. So that just sets them up to sweep Arkansas. Because I'm like, oh, man, I feel good about it. Something about LSU and Arkansas in the regular season, I'm not saying Arkansas has never beat them, but golly, it always feels like when Arkansas is in position or they're the better team and they should beat them, something always happens. And it always, always seems to be game one Arkansas wins and they give up the next two. That's another frustrating thing. Like last year is a little bit annoying. But last year, Arkansas took care of business game one, beat Paul Skeens, had Hunter Holland and Hagen Smith just mowing through, and then they had a doubleheader on that Saturday, and LSU just put it to Arkansas. Like, that's really an annoying thing. I think I remember one of the years, I want to say it was 2015 maybe. Maybe it was 20. I remember the year that it was in Fayetteville, and I remember Arkansas won game one, just smashed them. May have been 2018 actually. But smashed him game one. I think it was like just not even close. And then in game two, Arkansas was up 8 nothing, And gave up the lead and LSU ended up winning. Pretty sure that was the case. But either way, it's going to be a great series. Arkansas still has a game against Little Rock tomorrow and Baum Walker at 3 p.m. now as it's moved up. So that'll be uh, fascinating to see how that will be. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what to expect. LSU's still a good team. Every team in the SEC is going to be really good. I mean, Auburn is 1-5 in SEC play. And they're a really good team. Really good team. Now, Tennessee's a really good team, but they, they've already lost a series. You know, Georgia, uh, I mean, they're a weird team, too. They, like, swept one team and then lose another. I mean, it's just weird. Baseball's weird, especially this time of year. So don't take it anything too seriously and, and too much into consideration, but just understand that there is a lot of things that need to go out before – uh, we call this season or, or look at the season in a certain way. But I'm, I'm, I'm loving where baseball team's at right now. That, uh, let me be clear. Razorback baseball is in a great spot. They are number one. They're still consensus number one, rightfully so. I still believe they're the best team in baseball right now. And as long as you have Hagen Smith, man, I, I want to jinx it, but as long as you have Hagen Smith, I don't see many game ones Arkansas loses this year. not saying it can't happen because it will, more than likely. But I just don't see – he gives me the Blaine Knight vibes, but even better than Blaine Knight as far as – because Blaine Knight was great, but Hagen's got all the potential to be the number one overall pick. And as long as he keeps doing his thing, 
Now, you're always going to be in great shape. You're telling me if he can give you six scoreless innings every Friday? Yeah, you're uh, you're in good shape. So Arkansas baseball is going to be fine. Can't wait for it. You got back-to-back home series in the SEC. You got LSU and then Ole Miss. Uh, and then, you know, it just continues on to get really tough into this league. And uh, I can't wait to see how the rest of the season plays out. By the way, folks, I want to remind everybody, uh, we posted this on social media, but I want to tell everyone that this Thursday, we here at the John Neighbor Show, as well as Natty State Sports, we are going to be broadcasting live from Twin Peaks and Rogers, right there at the Pinnacle Hills Promenade. Uh, we're going to be getting you revved up for the NCAA tournament, games that are going to be transpiring, the Sweet 16 games that are going to be up there, and a lot more. And so we're really excited about doing it, and we're going to have some things to give away. We're going to have some shirts to give away, some Natty State shirts to give away. Uh, rumor has it we may even have some tickets to give away for that baseball series that's coming up this weekend. So just be on the lookout for that. But we'd love to see you out there and, and to come hang out with us. It'll be from 4 to 6 in the afternoon on this Thursday. Uh, live from Twin Peaks there in Rogers. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all and can't wait to hang out and watch some games and uh, get ready for Razorback Baseball and the NCAA Tournament Sweet 16 games because all that's going to be going down Thursday. And it's going to be a lot of fun and very exciting. Uh, we're going to take a break. We'll get to more of your phone calls and your text messages. And again, folks, if you want to call in, 936 246 2889 if you want to get your voice heard. But we got to tell you about. How here on the John Neighbor Show, we're brought to you by Alumni Hall here in Arkansas. Because we know you're going to have all the type of apparel that you want to have as a Razorback fan, right? I got this sweet Razorback hat. This is the official hat that the Razorback baseball team wears. This one right here. Well, with the charcoal color. And I got it from Alumni Hall. Now, I probably don't look as good wearing it as the Razorback baseball team does. But, you know, it makes me feel like a ball player. You know, it makes me feel like I know ball a little bit. I don't. But that's what Alumni Hall helps you out with is they have the official apparel not only from the players, but also coaches too. Like every Eric Musselman polo, if you've ever liked one of those, if you want to feel like you know ball, like Eric Musselman does, better go get you a polo shirt over there at Alumni Hall. So visit the website at nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. That's nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. Visit that website and you can check out all the different apparel that they have to choose from for men, women, kids, pets, everybody, as well as all the decor. And if you're not somebody that makes it easy to get to the Fayetteville location because you live outside of the Northwest Arkansas area, well, no, none to worry. Because when you go to that website, nightstaysports.com slash alumni hall, you can make orders and have it shipped directly to your door. It's simple as that. I mean, what could be better than that? You don't have to worry about going out and fighting all the traffic and everything. Just have it delivered. So check it out at nightstaysports.com slash alumni hall. All the Razorback things that you could possibly want for a true Razorback fan it is Alumni All here in Fayetteville. We'll take a break and come back with more of your phone calls and text messages coming up next here on the John Neighbors Show live from the United States Sports Studios. So stay with us. We're not done yet either. So don't be satisfied. We're not done. I mean, honestly, I don't really remember post game. I guess I black out after games, winning and losing. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Just tell me you missed it. I'm not going to go there with you, Why not? And that will be the last question I answer with that hat on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. That is why Arkansas is fantastic. Yes, sir. You know, and, and I like, you know, I didn't like the game, but I'm glad I was able to walk off the floor again and deep inside and have that funny feeling that, hey, one more time, Horn. Best guys, uh, I know it's a tough time for you. Uh, the coach is gone, but you got a new coach now, and you got to listen to what he says. Okay, I know you're thinking, oh, who is this new guy? Where's the other guy that crashed the motorcycle? We like him better. He was cool or whatever. Forget about all that. Listen to the new coach and get out there and win some games. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. You guys act like it's... Pick it up a little bit, okay? Get your chin up. Smile. Smile. Okay? Dang, you guys all right? If not, I'm not talking. Red, so excited. Good red. Oh, oh. Guys, I've got just one thing I want to say to you. Touchdown, Arkansas! 
I was the teacher today. Told those boys, welcome to the SEC. Well, Fayetteville is 1,843 miles away, but the call of the Hawks can be heard all the way to San Francisco. Let's stick my dick in the mashed potato. Go Hawks. Powered by Arkansas for Arkansas. Every time you put a mic in my face, I'm going to say Arkansas. The John Neighbor Show is live from the Natty State Sports Studios. All right, welcome back into the John Neighbor Show here live from Natty State Sports Studios. Appreciate everybody listening in and watching in on this beautiful day here in the great state of Arkansas. I'm your host, John Neighbors, and appreciate each and every one of you for making us a part of your afternoon this afternoon. If you want in on the conversation, you can hop into the chat here on our live stream, but you can also call in on this show right now at 936-24-NATTY. That's 936-246-2889. To get your voice heard as uh, we're just expanding all the types of technologies here on the show and making it to where everybody can get involved. Because so let's be honest, as someone who worked in sports talk radio as long as I did, the, the phone calls were always a big part of it. Whether I like it or not, or whether I enjoyed it or not, it was always a big part. So we have added that element. We're working towards a text line, too, so uh, we'll keep you updated on it. But still got a lot of cool things happening here at Natty State Sports, so... Uh, appreciate you watching in, but also be sure to subscribe to the pot at the palace. They're keeping all up to date on the transfer portal as it every single day there's changes. So check it out. NatStateSports.com. Get your information there too. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed because it's free 99 and you're not going to get better coverage than what we offer here at Natty state sports. But, uh, we got a few things happening. We've talked basketball and baseball for the Razorbacks, but I did want to move into a little bit of Razorback spring football as we have a chance to check out practice once again tomorrow morning at 825. Now, spring practice did not go on this past week because of spring break, and it starts to resume, and Arkansas is going to have uh, this week of practice, and then I believe it's a Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday scrimmages, or at least practices that are going to be open to the media. Same thing next week, and then you have the spring game uh, happening, I guess, two weeks from this Saturday. So... A lot of football to be consumed and some things that uh, I know that people are looking forward to seeing just from the sake of football being here. But heading into this week, there are a few things that I would like to see selfishly. It's spring practice. You can always see so much. I want to be able to film so much. But there are some things that I'd like to see. And one of those being about two things. On the offensive side, I want to see if they, one, stick with the same starting lineup and the same 11 starters that they've had out there pretty much the entire time. Because if so, I think it's over. Like, nobody needs to worry about any other competitions. That seems to be the case. But that also includes, besides the starting 11, the backup quarterback position. Are we going to see anything different from what we saw the first two weeks with the battle for QB two. Every single practice, it was either Jacoby Criswell or is Malachi Singleton that usually ran out there with the twos first. KJ Jackson's gotten a lot of run. I'm I'm really like him. I really like him. He's he's got all the makings for a big time quarterback later. Maybe not right now, but later. But since Taylor Green has taken that spot as QB one. I want to see if anybody can step up and take that QB2 role. It's important. It's crucial. Because whoever that is, given circumstances and given the way college football is done and how it's played, that QB2 is going to play this year. They're going to have to step in. They're going to have to play a series, possibly even play a half, or maybe even play a game or two. Like We don't know. Like Football's crazy. And hopefully, Taylor Green never gets injured. We never want to see that. But there is an element to where that is a possibility. That's the way it'll go down. And if that's the case, I want to see someone separate themselves. Personally, I don't care if it's Malachi Singleton or Jacoby Criswell. Like, I just want to see the best man out there. And I know Petrino, given his history, is going to be able to put the right quarterback in place. You know, I don't think there's ever been a time where anyone's ever said, Man, Petrino, you, you should have played that backup quarterback instead of the other guy. Like, that's never happened. So I trust his judgment. 
But I want to know if this week someone's going to finally start separating themselves. Or are we going to go through pretty much the entire spring practice without even knowing? Or just going to keep having this bouncing back and forth? Like, that'll be the case. So that's really what I'm going to be looking at. But also on the defensive side, which doesn't get talked about enough because offense is sexy. I mean, let's be honest. It's, it's about the quarterback. It's about Petrino. It's about the offense. It's, that's what people want to know. And I don't disagree. But the defense, I want to be able to see if we can finally start having a linebacker that separates itself. And what I mean by that is that you got Xavion Sori, the transfer out of Georgia. You got Brad Spence, who was a linebacker last year. But that's really been it. And it keeps making me wonder, are those guys, those two guys specifically, are they the starting linebackers by default because you have nobody else? Because they're just there? Because they may be better than most of the players that you have there because you have walk-ons or you just lack depth or whatever? Like, are those guys just there by default? Or are those guys actually legitimate, high-level SEC caliber linebackers that are deserving of a starting spot. Now, I'll be honest, that may be something that we do not know about or do not hear more about until the fall even. Like, that, that could be the case. But I am curious of how that linebacker crew is going to look like and develop. Will there be another linebacker that we see here in spring that starts getting some run? getting some playing time because I am very concerned about linebacker folks like that is that is something that I am I, I like look at and I'm like oh I have no there's nothing I can just like spin it and turn it and be like no nah, I'll be fine like there's nothing I can do for that like it's just it's it's concerning it's a legitimate concern so those are the things I'm going to be looking for in spring ball this week uh, and, and how it develops and you think another thing too is Luke has you know he was injured or got hurt Last time we saw him, not in spring practice, uh, he got rolled up on by, I believe, it was Dominic Johnson. And then he didn't really play the rest of the game, or the rest of the practice. Now, he was out there with the team. Uh, he was still wearing his uniform and everything. So, you know, it wasn't anything as serious enough to where he had to be rushed to the doctors or anything like that. But I'm going to be curious tomorrow is he going to be back out there with the ones, business as usual, or is he going to be? Sitting out? Is he going to be dressed out? Is he going to be, you know, slowly but surely coming back? Or they haven't have him in some drills, some 11 on 11, some 7 on 7, but not all of it? Like, what's the situation going to be with his injury? Because that's huge. The offense for Razorback football, I'm not even worried about. It could be good, it could be great. But I think you have enough pieces there to where the offense is going to figure it out. And with Petrino at the helm, I'm, I'm not concerned. Like, I want to see what the offensive line can do and continue to develop. That's for sure. But skill position-wise, I think you're about as solid there as you've been. I love Taylor Green and what he's adding. But I like the linebacker or the running back room. The running back room looks good. You lost Rocket Sanders. You lost A.J. Green. I get it, but... Rashad Dabinian's really good. Um, I think the the transfer, Quinden, is from Utah. is going to be really good. I feel like he might be my pick for the leading rusher this year. Uh, I think that you've also seen some good things out of Braylon Russell, the true freshman. Him getting into the mix. Dominic Johnson's even getting some runs. So I like the running back position. The wide receivers I'm, I'm really big on. Because those guys are pretty much set in stone as far as who Petrino likes and the, the three-man goes. And you got Tyrone Broden, you got Andrew Armstrong, and you got Isaiah Satania in the slot position. It seems to be a reoccurring theme. And then even after that, you still got some guys that are that are good, like Isaac Tesla, I think, I think will get targets this year. So I think wide receiver, you're good. Tight end. And you know Luke has, has got dinged up a little bit, but assuming that he's healthy and then Ty Washington comes back healthy, which I hear that we might have a chance to see Ty Washington this week after he came off of his injury from last year. But uh, tight end position, I think you're, you're golden. And the offensive line is going to be better than what it was last year. Can't be much worse, that's for sure. Like, that was, that was bad. That was bad watching that each and every day. But overall, I like, I like the offense, the defense, I'm, I'm actually high on the secondary. 
I'm solid on the D line and I'm concerned about the linebacker. That is a combination I never thought I'd say because I always felt like Arkansas had the worst secondary forever, always, every single season. But I, I do believe that the strength of this defensive team will be the secondary. You have experienced guys, you got athletes, guys that play well together. There's not a glaring hole or a glaring position that's just like, oh, this is bad. And you got depth there. And I even think on the D-line, you lost some pieces, but I've been impressed by what Deke Adams has been able to do since he's coached, not only in recruiting, but out of the transfer portal. And so, I mean, I think that the the, the D-line will be solid. I'm, I don't know if it'll be elite. I don't know if it'll be like one of the best arts I've ever had, but it'll be good enough. It won't be a weakness. It won't be a glaring problem. The linebacker's a big part of it, though. Linebacker's a huge part of it. Uh, so, yeah, we're talking football here on the John Neighbors Show. So if you want to get in on the conversation, 936-246-2889 is the phone number to call in. You can also hop into the chat, too. Uh, Braden says, curious your take, John, on the comparison of leadership between Taylor and Green this year and what KJ has been. Do you see more of an energy boost this year because of this? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to speak on this carefully so no one takes it the wrong way. Because I was a big KJ fan. Yeah, if you followed me along and during that whole time, if like I, I was a big KJ fan and, I, and I'm still rooting for KJ. I don't have any ill will towards KJ. You know, I don't know why any Razorback fan would have ill will towards KJ. But I will say that there was, compared to the quarterbacks that I've been around and that I've covered and that I've known at Arkansas, there was certainly a, a thing to where it felt like he was kind of always on his own. I think he had the respect of his teammates, but it just seemed like there was something not there. And I kind of also got that vibe from like Kendall Bryles when he was at Arkansas. He, he, was a, he was a really good play caller, but I just don't know if Kendall Bryles was able to have the relationship with his quarterback and developing of a quarterback to where it fit and it moved forward and it was great. And, it was it gave the ultimate definition of a system quarterback's deal. And that's what's different with having Bobby Petrino here. Is Bobby Petrino, with pretty much every quarterback he's ever had, there's been a strong bond and a strong relationship. Ryan Mallett, Tyler Wilson here at Arkansas, strong. I mean, Lamar Jackson got him the Heisman at Louisville, strong. Even Brian Brome over at uh, his first days in Louisville, strong. Like there was always just a, I, I, you know what to expect to me. I know what to expect to you. We're going to be close. We're going to be working together. You're my guy, and I chose you. You're not here because I, you know, just by default, and I'm going to make you fit my system. I chose you because I believe in what you're able to do and your skill set to help us win games. And so what I've seen that from Taylor Green and from Bobby Petrino is you have that. That's why I feel like Taylor and Green and Bi wanted to be at Arkansas for Bobby Petrino. And that's why Bobby Petrino wanted Taylor and Green is they they understood each other. They under, he understood and looking at him and his film and, and recruiting him when he was coming out of high school, he's like, this is a guy that has what I want in my quarterback. And because of that mutual respect there, I think the rest of it falls underneath it. Where when the when the offensive coordinator and Petrino have that. With this quarterback, Taylor Green, the rest of the offense is going to be like, okay, well, he's our guy. He's our dude. This is our quarterback. This is our QB1, and we're fine with him. So let's just go with it and move forward. And because of that, they're just going to fall in line afterwards. That's the vibe I've always gotten from a Petrino offense. doesn't mean that's all like 100% true, but that's the vibe that I've always gotten. Uh, which I'm, I think that, Petrino, say what you want about him, but the dude's going to have an offense. The dude's going to have a quarterback that can throw the ball. And I, I really, truly believe that the coaching changes in the position groups that we've seen at running back, at wide receiver, at offensive line, and also at quarterback, it's going to make the offense move forward a lot better when Petrino has his assistant coaches that he trusts under him. And from what I understand, Mateos, the offensive line coach who was hired, I guess technically before Bobby Petrino was hired as the OC, that they really get along and they're they're doing some great things together. So that's that's yet to be seen. But I just truly believe that there's no way Bobby Petrino is going to have 
going to walk into this season and looking at it as like, well, you know, I'll just make do with what I got. And whatever Coach Pittman thinks is best for the players, like, oh, I'll just take them. I think it's more like, hey, I, these are the guys that I see, and I'm going to go into the transfer portal and try to get the ones I really want, and then I'll see what we got in the guys in the roster, and we'll make it work. Because if you also think about it too, folks, getting Taylor Williams out of the transfer portal was one of the quickest and earliest things that Petrino did when he arrived on campus. Because that's the most important position, as we all know, but it's the most important position for Petrino by far. Petrino's offenses only go so far as the quarterback. And if he does not have a quarterback that he feels good about, if you're strong about, then it ain't going to work. Doesn't mean that Jacoby Criswell's a bad quarterback or that Malachi Singleton's a bad quarterback. They could develop into that. But when it comes to winning right now and winning this year, they got to get the right guy right now. And I think that you're certainly going to have that with Bobby Petrino and Taylor Green. That was a long answer to your question, <laughs> pretty much. But, uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm feeling like right now. Let's see. Random Stuff says, what's the kicker looking like? Is little going to be missed? You know, the kicker is always an interesting thing because we don't talk enough about the kicker. But uh, Vito Calvaruso, the transfer from Wisconsin, it looks like he's going to be the guy. Uh, he's He did kickoff duties last year for Arkansas. But... Uh, looks like he's he's actually a big kid, too. I didn't realize it. He's listed at 6'3", 215 pounds. It's pretty good size for a kicker. So it looks like he's going to be the guy. But here's the deal. Is he going to be as good as Cam Little? Is Cam Little going to be mixed? I have no idea because this guy could go out there and practice and be nailing 60 yarders. But it's a little different when you're on the road over there and wherever, you know, in Stillwater, and you got the game-winning field goal on the line, and you got to kick a 49-yarder. I don't give a rip what a kicker looks like. If there is a if there is one thing that I do not pay one lick of attention to in practice, it's kicking. Because that means diddly. I, I cannot tell you how many times Cole Hedlund in those practices with Brett Bielma, dude was nails. He was killing it, like 67-yard field goals. Just, oh, man, not missing a one. And then what happened in the games? Doink fest right and left. So... Again, I'm not taking anything from kicking until they actually get into the game. Because if I told you sitting here, it'd be like, oh, man, Vito Calvaruso, he's made 100% of his kicks, 50 yarders. What's that going to mean? What's it going to mean? Nothing until they actually get into the games themselves. That's all I'm saying. Nick says, uh, what do you mean, John? How can the O-line not be much worse? Who is standing out on the O-line? You were a hype and named players from every position except the O-line. No, I named some players from the O-line. I still believe Josh Braun, Addison Nichols, as well as uh, Fernando Carmona are going to be three SEC high-caliber offensive linemen. Like I firmly believe that. I think Blackstock is going to find his way. I think he's pretty much solidified that tackle spot in that position. But the transfer from Michigan State, I think, is going to be a big one, and he's going to really be helpful to Arkansas. And I know Tykeus Crawford is one that I always got asked about or mentioned, but I know I, I just don't know if that's going to happen for him. But Patrick Kutis is another player. Which, by the way, if you haven't listened to the Boss Hawks podcast, Patrick Kutis and Brooks Edmondson were on it this morning, so you need to check it out. Uh, but I think Kutis is also going to be really good. So I like the offensive line. The three guys of Braun, Nichols, and Carmona, I'm really big fans of. Like Carmona was a player a lot of major schools wanted. And Addison Nichols has been a part of a Tennessee program that he had success, especially on the offensive side. So there, that good. I, I think the offensive line is going to be good. I'll see what Blackstock looks like as more time goes on because there was a reason why him and Crawford in the beginning were battling it out for that tackle position. But I like what we've seen so far from the O line. But until it happens in until it happens in a game, like there's, what's it what's it going to mean though? Because last year, we were talking about the D-line. is like, oh, man, this might be the most dominant D-line we've ever seen at Arkansas. And then pfft, ended up being the O-line was getting trashed on. So, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, directions it could be. But, man, um, I still feel good about the offense. Right now, I would say I am 85% confident that the offense is going to be far improved from last year. But I'm about 50% confident that the defense will be improved or just as good from last year. 
just because that linebacker position is really tough, man. There's there's just a lot of glaring holes in all of that. I hope I'm wrong. Like, I'll take it. Like I'll, I'll take it if I get shut up. I'm always a fan of that. I'm always getting a fan of proven wrong if it means success for the Razorback football team. So I guess we'll just wait and see how long that plays out. Uh, we'll get to more of your comments, folks. If you want to get in on the phone lines, again, 936-246-2889 is the phone number to call in. But I'm going to tell you about our friends over at Superior Contracting and Development there in Valonia, as they are licensed and residential commercial contractors specializing in all aspects of home rebuilding and remodeling. They handle everything from fencing to drainage and additions to remodeling of your existing structure all the way to land development and ground-up construction no matter what. So you call them today, 501-453-3053. Call them today, and they'll be able to help you out with all the interior and exterior construction and remodeling needs that you may have. You know, Pricing for new houses is expensive right now, so don't worry about getting you a new house. Just add on to the new one or to the old one. Be able to go inside of the old one and make some new structure there inside it too. But when you do, make sure you call Superior Contracting and Development or you can email them at contracting at superiorark.com. Visit their website at superiorark.com or just call them. Get a real person, a real person from the state of Arkansas as they service all four corners of the state. Call them today at 501-453-3053 at Superior Contracting and Development. We'll take a break and we'll come back. With a little March Madness talk, as well as more of your phone calls and more of your messages here on the John Neighbor Show live from the United States Sports Studio. So stay with us. We're not done yet either. So don't be satisfied because we're not done. I mean, honestly, I don't really remember post game. I guess I black out after games, winning and losing. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Just tell me you missed it. I'm not going to go there with you. Why not? And that will be the last question I answer with that hat on. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shoot. That is why Arkansas is fantastic. Yes, sir! You know, and, and I like, you know, I didn't like the game, but I'm glad I was able to walk off the floor again and deep inside and have that funny feeling that, hey, one more time, Horn. Best guys, uh, I know it's a tough time for you. Uh, the coach is gone, but you've got a new coach now, and you got to listen to what he says. Okay, I know you're thinking, oh, who is this new guy? Where's the other guy that crashed the motorcycle? We like him better. He was cool or whatever. Forget about all that. Listen to the new coach and get out there and win some games. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. You guys act like it's... Pick it up a little bit, okay? Get your chin up. Smile. Smile. Okay? Dang, you guys all right? If not, I'm not talking. I'm so excited. Big red. Oh, oh. Guys, I've got just one thing I want to say to you. Touchdown, Arkansas! I was a teacher today. Told those boys, welcome to the SEC. Fayetteville is 1,843 miles away, but the call of the Hawks can be heard all the way to San Francisco. Let's take my dick in the mashed potato. Go Hawks. Powered by Arkansas for Arkansas. Every time you put a mic in my face, I'm going to say Arkansas. The John Neighbors Show is live from the Natty State Sports Studios. All right, welcome back into the John Neighbors Show. You're live from United States Sports Studios. Appreciate everybody listening in and watching in on this beautiful day here in the great state of Arkansas. As I am your host, John Neighbors, and appreciate each and every one of you for making us a part of your afternoon this afternoon. As uh, we just got about 30 minutes left of the show, we'll get into, uh, hey, y'all see this, and a little bit, too, of uh, some of the fun stories to talk about. Uh, But uh, I did want to bring up a little bit of the NCAA tournament because those of you, which pretty much all of you, filled out brackets, been watching the tournament. It's been great, man. I, 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 there's nothing better than the NCAA tournament. Schools that you never even heard of becoming famous. Players you never even heard of becoming household names. I mean, that's the really... I, would I have ever known anyone named Ali Farouk Manesh if it wasn't for the NCAA tournament? No. But I even known that there was a school called Florida Gulf Coast if it wasn't for the NCAA tournament. No. So it's been awesome. But 
as most of you probably are the same way as I am, or maybe not, but I my bracket's been shot, man. Like, there's actually a lot of chalk games for the most part. Like, all one seeds are still standing uh, into the Sweet 16 matchups that'll be happening on Thursday, which, by the way, come watch it with us over at Twin Peaks. But you got UConn going up against Iowa State in the Sweet 16 match, or no, UConn going up against San Diego State in the Sweet 16 matchup there. You got Illinois and Iowa State uh, in that particular matchup. UNC and Bama going up against Clemson and Arizona. Creighton and Tennessee going up against each other. Purdue and Gonzaga going up against each other. NC State and Marquette might be the wildest one just because NC State had to win their uh, conference tournament to get to this point, and here they are. And then Houston and Duke happening in the next one too. So, yeah, it's just not been great for me. It's not been great. But uh, overall, I see that the SEC has not done very well. Not at all. I mean, yeah, sure, you got Tennessee still in. You got Bama still in. But it's been a disaster for the conference. South Carolina losing to Oregon. Gross. A&M gave Houston all they wanted, so at least I'll give them credit for that. And I don't really consider them being one of the teams I'm referring to. It's mainly Auburn and Kentucky. Auburn, Kentucky, and South Carolina. Those are the big ones. Mississippi State even disappointed me, but still, at least it was an 8-9 game. Auburn being a four-seed, lost first round. Kentucky being a three-seed, lost first round. South Carolina being a six-seed, lost first round. I made, I started thinking about it. At least the, the joke, maybe a joke, but I'm going to take it as for real. The SEC really needed Arkansas in this NCAA tournament, y'all. Arkansas didn't deserve to go. They didn't. It was a terrible year. And I'm not hating on the teams that made it because they had really good seasons and they deserve to be in. But the SEC and Greg Sankey, who's Sankey's been somebody who's been crowing for an expanded NCAA tournament. Yeah, they, you don't really have much of a case on it when you're looking at your teams in your own conference there, Sankey. Because everyone's been bad. And, and, and what's sad about it all is that it's not even surprising. It's not even surprising that the SEC is bad in this. Like, I was not shocked at all that Auburn lost in the first round. Not at all. Like, since COVID hit, since Muss has been the coach at Arkansas, essentially, Auburn has been garbage in the NCAA tournament. Bama made it to another Sweet 16. That's great. But they're going to get smoked by UNC. Like Bama, Bama can score, but they can't stop a nosebleed. Like They are so bad defensively. So they're not going to go any further than the Sweet 16. Tennessee's the best bet. Tennessee has potential to go to the Final Four, but I don't know if they're going to be able to beat Purdue. Like That's going to be the matchup. They got Creighton coming up, and they could very well lose that, especially with Rick Barnes who is regular season Rick is what he's been known for. But it's just it's just been pathetic. And from what it looks like right now, John Calipari in Kentucky, uh, at least what I'm looking at right now and people who are covering it from Kentucky Sports Radio and everything, it looks like he's going to remain on as coach at Kentucky. So, which I think is the right move, to be honest. Like, uh, Kentucky fans are probably fed up. Kentucky Park has been a disaster in postseason play and in the NCAA tournament. There's no question about that. But I just don't know of like what Kentucky thinks they're going to do if they hire, fire Calipari. I mean, what, what are they? Who are they going to bring in immediately? That's going to be immediately better. Uh, I I just don't think that they could do right now. Now next year could change everything. There could be a coach that's open. That makes sense. All of that can change. But I just don't think now is the time to fire Calipari. I think next year might be the year. Where it's it's winter go home. It's just the vibe I get. It could be wrong. He could be getting the axe now, like tonight. But it's just the vibe I get. But it's just been pathetic how the SEC's looked in, in, in the NCAA tournament. And truly, if it hasn't been for Arkansas and Eric Musselman since uh, the COVID season happened, the SEC would be the laughing stock of conferences in the NCAA tournament. I mean, Arkansas still the only team to go to the Elite Eight since COVID. Think about that. From the SEC, Arkansas is the only team from the SEC to make it to the Elite Eight. The only team. 
And they did it twice. That's bad. That's bad. I think the SEC's improved as a conference overall. I think they've done some good things in the basketball side of things. I think they have some good coaches. But this is what a lot of those fans of these particular new basketball schools, quote-unquote, like Bama and Auburn and all of that, this is what they don't understand. True basketball success in the college level does not get ranked or looked at by your SEC regular season titles or even tournament titles for that matter. Auburn, look at you. Great, you won the SEC. Congratulations. Does anybody give a rip? No. Why? Because you lost to Yale in the first round. If you're an Auburn, if you if you are an Auburn basketball fan and if you're worth your salt, you're not going to 5 10 years from now look back upon this particular season and be like, "Man, that was a great year." Why? Well, we won the SEC tournament. Oh, yeah, that's cool. What'd you do in the tournament, though? Lost to Yale. Oh. Okay. If you look at this year in a positive way, that that just shows how you, you just don't, you're not a college basketball program. You're not a real college basketball fan. Like, that's not what the success is measured by. And the same thing with Kentucky. Kentucky gets it. Kentucky fans get it. They're a big-time program. You know what they get? It does not matter how many games you win in the regular season. It does not matter if you won the regular season in the SEC. It does not matter what you did in the SEC tournament. What matters is your NCAA tournament success. And if you don't believe me, just look at what John Calipari is going through right now. There are, there, there are people wanting him fired from Kentucky. Fired. But he's had so much success in the regular season. It's had success in the SEC tournament. Why, why, why would they fire him? Because you're not getting it done when it matters the most, and that is in the field of 68. That's what true, legitimate, big-time college basketball programs care about. Like, yeah, there is a, there is a somewhat gratifying feeling whenever you win your conference regular season. Sure, yeah, it's nice. It's something to be celebrated. Same thing with the, as the conference tournament. If you win it, yes, absolutely. Something to be celebrated. Something you can put a banner up, and it's great. But when it comes to where you stand as a program, give me an Elite Eight appearance with no SEC regular season title or tournament title over an SEC regular season title and or SEC tournament title where you get bounced in the first round. I would take an Elite Eight appearance all day, every day, and twice on Sunday over that. Because that's what people remember. That's what people care about. What Eric Musselman's getting graded on and where he's looked at and why he's considered one of the best coaches in the SEC and in college basketball is not because of his stellar regular season record, because to be honest, in the SEC play, it ain't that great. But why is he considered that? Why is he looked at that way? Because he is freaking eight and three in the NCAA tournament in the past four seasons. Didn't make it this year. We know. I know. But that's what people measure. Legitimate college basketball fans. That's what they measure success of their program and their coach as. Is what they do in the NCAA tournament. That's what matters. That's what matters. Rick Barnes is a great coach. Great coach. But there's a reason why, and it's looked at in a negative way, he's referred to as regular season Rick. Because he can only get it done in the regular season. He gets to the NCAA tournament, high-level seed, 2C, 3C, 4C, doesn't matter. Gets a high-level seed and doesn't even make it to the second weekend in most occasions. Now, he did this year, and that's great. But they don't call Rick... Barnes, regular season Rick as a compliment. <laughs> they use it as an insult. Why? Because he doesn't get it done in the NCAA tournament. So the answer to the whole question is yes, I do believe the SEC is hurting right now and really wishing Arkansas was in the NCAA tournament. Not only for the sake of success, but also for the sake of viewership and money. 
Kentucky, then Arkansas. Those are the two most watched, most paid attention to, most cared about basketball programs in the SEC, and that's not an argument. So when Kentucky gets bounced in the first round and Arkansas is not in the NCAA tournament, that's bad. That's bad for the conference. Call it bias. Call it uh, rose-tinted glasses. I don't really care what you call it, but it's the truth. Arkansas needs to get back to the tournament for their own sake, but I think the conference, for their sake too, they need Arkansas in the tournament. They need Eric Musselman and Arkansas in the NCAA tournament because that is what breeds success in winning games. I just imagine as you how you would feel as a Razorback fan if you with Eric Musselman, if you made the NCAA tournament and you were like one and three instead of eight and three. Like how would you feel? I'd feel crap. I'd feel no different than when Mike Anderson was here. I could just be like, great. But how do you feel when you're eight and three? How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel about the state of the program? About Eric Musselman. Like, how does that make you feel? Strong. Strong is what it should make you feel like. I still believe in Arkansas. I still believe in Eric Musselman. I still believe they're going to be back, but the NCAA tournament just hasn't been the same. And the SEC, they got to figure something out. They got to they got to get, like, Kentucky's got to get good again in the tournament. As much as I hate to say it, but it's true. The SEC wants, needs Kentucky to be a factor in the NCAA tournament. They need Arkansas to be a factor in the NCAA tournament. And no offense, but do you all remember when South Carolina made the Final Four with Frank Martin? Remember that? It's weird, wasn't it? Frank Martin didn't make postseason a single time as coach except for that one year we went to the Final Four. But how many people actually, like, cared like, did the SEC just, not, like, they just built them up because now, oh, man, people are going to start paying attention to South Carolina basketball now. No. They need teams to advance, and they need their bread and butter, their big programs, the programs that get cared about and watched the most. They need Kentucky, and they need Arkansas. And Arkansas failed at that, and so did Kentucky. At least they made the tournament, but... Losing to Oakland is not exactly giving a lot of good vibes out of there in Lexington. But I really hope that uh, people understand that. And I'm sure that if there are any of the uh, fans from other schools listening or watching in right now, they're probably fed up. They're probably freaking out, man. How dare you? How dare you say that? We care about basketball. Where's your banners? My favorite thing ever is when I got a, I'll never forget this. I think it was, was it last year? Two years ago. I think it was after the time that Arkansas went to the Elite Eight and played Gonzaga, beat Gonzaga. It was in that offseason, like right afterwards. I made a joke on social media. And call you know, just got a little playful troll. Just about Auburn because uh, they had gotten bounced early and they were a team that was really good that year you know they were number one ranking for a while and I remember I made a joke about him and an Auburn fan found it and he tweeted at me a picture he says you don't you know you don't you didn't get at least we have one of these this year I think is what he said and the picture was simply a banner that was hanging up in their arena for their SEC regular season championship it's like true didn't have it but the humorous thing about it is that was the only banner within earshot or eye shot of that entire thing. He took a picture of wide angle and there were no other banners around it except for that one SEC regular season title. And if I was at Bud Walton Arena, I wasn't at the time, but if I was at Bud Walton Arena, I would have returned said tweet with a picture of Arkansas's rafters at Bud Walton. Of showing you're right, you won the regular season. Arkansas has not won the regular season in the SEC. I don't believe in since 1995. Maybe even didn't win it then. They haven't done it very often. It's true. But there's a reason why they had to make some adjustments in Bud Walton Arena for their rafter space because of how many banners that they have. And you know what else, too, folks? You know what you get a banner for? 
lead eight appearances. You do. Sweet 16 appearances. You do it for that too. But give me the program. Give me the history. Give me the future. Give me of everything. saw Eric Musselman next season. It's going to be a fun one. At least I hope so. For the sake of all of us, baby. Like, we don't want to go through this again. We can't do this again. But there you have it. There is our uh, little spiel and talking some trash against SEC programs, even though Arkansas wasn't in the tournament. I had to do a little bit of it, you know. I had to, I had to throw it out there a little bit. But we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we'll get to the Hey, Did Y'all See This segment. Get some more of your chats comments if you got any phone calls you can do that too but we'll do that and then close up shop here on the john neighbor show so stay with us live from nice state sports studios we're not done yet either so don't be satisfied because we're not done i mean honestly i don't really remember post game i guess i black out after games winning and losing you missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Just tell me you missed it. I'm not going to go Why not? And that will be the last question I answer with that hat on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. That is why Arkansas is fantastic. Yes, sir. You know, and, and I like, you know, I didn't like the game, but I'm glad I was able to walk off the floor again and deep inside and have that funny feeling that, hey, one more time, Horn. Best guys, uh, I know it's a tough time for you. Uh, the coach is gone, but you've got a new coach now, and you got to listen to what he says. Okay, I know you're thinking, oh, who is this new guy? Where's the other guy that crashed the motorcycle? We like him better. He was cool or whatever. Forget about all that. Listen to the new coach and get out there and win some games. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. You guys act like it's... Pick it up a little bit, okay? Get your chin up. Smile. Smile. Okay? Hey, you guys, all right? If not, I'm not talking. I'm so excited. Good friends. Oh, oh. Guys, I've got just one thing I want to say to you. Touchdown, Arkansas! I was a teacher today. Told those boys, welcome to the SEC. Fayetteville is 1,843 miles away, but the call of the Hawks can be heard all the way to San Francisco. Let's take my dick in the mashed potato. Go Hawks. Powered by Arkansas for Arkansas. Every time you put a mic in my face, I'm going to say Arkansas. The John Neighbor Show is live from the Natty State Sports Studios. All right, final segment here on the John Neighbor Show. Appreciate each and every one of you listening in and watching in on this beautiful day here in the great state of Arkansas. As we're going to get to our final segment, which, of course, is, hey, did you all see this? And try to get to some of your comments, too, if any of you have some of that, which I'm sure you do. And just uh, sometimes I'm uh, looking into the chat and I get a little worried about some of you. I'm just going to be honest. I get worried about some of you. But I did like the uh, the fact, uh, where is it at? Yeah, Dalton's Motorsports says, Sean Fred Durst Neighbors. Now, listen, I'm not a hat guy. If you guys have seen me on this show, I do not wear hats very often. But uh, my hair is out of control, and I'm getting a haircut tomorrow. And with it raining today, I didn't want to deal with it, so I just put a hat on. And I can't, I don't know, I just don't really wear many hats forward-facing unless I'm playing golf. And it's not because I think I look cool. It's just because I have a weird shaped head and it looks ridiculous if like forward facing as much as it does backwards. So just bear with me. It's, it's, it's a one time deal. All right. Relax. But still uh, appreciate everybody. I've been watching in and been listening in as uh, we're going to get to the, Hey, did y'all see this segment? And uh, we also have our intern back in. Uh, we got intern will back with us. What's up, man? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're doing good, I guess right now. Uh, we're talking about sports and the excitement surrounding them and Razorback. So I know you're a big fan of it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, make sure you get up on that microphone too when you can. So that way people can hear you. I mean, because people listen to eat. 
as much as it is crazy to think, yeah, like I said, that microphone stand, you might just have to turn turn the mic sideways towards up towards you like that. There you go. That That's much better. That's much better. So, but uh, yeah, so I know you went on spring break, right? Where'd you go? Okay. Cool. So yeah, you went to Seaside and everything. So um, yeah, well, that's cool, man. Yeah, I know people were excited to get to the point to where they were at uh, and on the spring break side of things too but uh we're gonna have uh some other things to talk about and hey did y'all see this segment because i i mean it's show you did a good job of putting some of this stuff together by the way but uh let's see getting to that point i'm gonna have to put up the uh the google sheet there okay yeah so i'll have to have to make this work but either way uh let's see first thing we'll talk about yes i know that Car- uh, darius or carius Kern has uh, officially inter, uh, decommitted from Arkansas. For those of you commenting, yes, we talked about that. So I just wanted to to clarify for all of you there that, yes, I am aware. Yes, it did happen. And no, I don't see it as a major ordeal. Like, I mean, it, it does happen in Razorback sports probably way too often. But, you know, you're also eight, you're talking about 17, 18-year-old kids right now. Like, that's a problem no matter what. But still... Uh, speaking of the NFL though, cause I do want to, like, we don't talk a lot of NFL on here, but this is something that, uh, I at least want to talk about dealing with the NFL and specifically tackling in the NFL. Cause there is nothing that I feel worse for than defensive backs in the college football or NFL ranks. But look at this. So the hip drop tackle is officially illegal. I, I just don't get this. Owners banned the hip drop tackle on Monday morning during the annual league meeting in Florida. And the NFL's co- competition committee was unanimous in their voice that the tackle was the one that the league wanted out of the game. And owners agreed. So here's what it is as follows. Hip drop tackle. It is a foul if a player uses the following technique to bring a runner to the ground. Grabs runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms. So we're already being in a bad way because to me, that's a pretty standard thing when it comes to the game of football. But that's not only what they do. It has to include this part. And unweights himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body, landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. I understand that you are constantly wanting it to have safety in football and I completely and totally agree with you on every step of that but when I'm seeing this and you are trying to ban this to where it ends up being a uh, penalty of 15 yards and an automatic first down a player wrapping hands or runners with both arms and then unweights himself by swiveling or dropping his hips that's tackling and tackle football. I, just, I, I saw all these former d- d- players and even current players taking to social media, going on ESPN and everything, voicing their displeasure with this. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? Like, wh- what are we doing here? It is so vastly unfair. I, I can't imagine as a defensive player how you play the game. I can't imagine as a defensive coach how you teach and coach the game. The offense and every offensive player, time and time and time and time and time again, they get the rules bent and adjusted to favor them. There is, I can't remember the last time that there's been a defensive player or a defensive rule change that's helped the defense play the game. I haven't seen one single thing. And it's just really frustrating because we all love football. And we all want to see players play and players not get hurt. Get that. But this is just, uh, this is absurd. Like targeting, okay, I'm down for. You shouldn't lead with the crown of your helmet and hit somebody in the head. Like I, I, I'm i down for that. Even the tackling at the like the knees or below the knees, especially when it comes to the quarterback, I'm like, eh, okay. I mean, yeah, I get it. Even players talk about how they'd rather be hit in the knee or hit in the leg than in the head, or rather be hit in the head than hit in the knee and the leg because 
You know, you can, they feel like you can recover from a concussion or recover from that type of hit a lot easier than you can from a torn ACL, which is true. I'm even down for that. But this is just like, how do you, like, how, 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 if you're a player, how do you tackle? Like, truly, how do you tackle? If you're a defensive back and you're trying to take down Derrick Henry, how do you do it? How do you do it? Yeah, yeah, like, you don't do it. You, you don't, you don't, you don't do anything. You, you try your best. You hope that maybe you just hit him and he falls down. But besides that, you can't do anything. You're, you're stuck with this. They Yes, they need to go to two-hand touch at this point. Like, they might as well. Yeah. Yeah. Flagrant run, flagrant two. Yeah, I think that'd be okay. Yeah, it's just kind of like it is in basketball. Yeah, I think so. I think that would be okay. That would be beneficial. Something like that at least would be sensical like that would be logical but like doing it this way i i just i just don't understand why like again i don't want anyone hurt but this is a gladiator sport this is this is a sport where you're putting yourself out there it's a physical game there is not a single person in the nfl that is playing against their will there's not a single player that is playing because they are being forced to by anybody or anything they're getting paid millions of dollars to play this game and there comes with that risks doesn't mean you can't do things to try to curb that more doesn't mean you can't try to do the best you possibly can to make the game better and safer like that doesn't mean that you can't do those things but I am not down with completely year after year changing it to where you can't tackle like that that's the if you talk about basics of football and where things stand like the first thing you always come to mind, tackle, tackle, because there's no other sport that you really do that in. Like you don't, I mean, I guess rugby, you have a little bit of an element of physicality. Hockey, you got a little bit of physicality, but when it comes to the play stopping because a player went to the ground, that's what makes football football. Like that, that's what it is. And so the more you try to change that and to take it away and to make it more difficult on tackling, the less it's going to become football and, and the less it's going to be, uh, fun for anybody because it's just going to be the offense. It's going to be seven on seven flag football type of games. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to deal with that. But yeah, yeah, people are going to see They're going to stop coming to the games. They're going to stop caring about it. But that, that was pretty much all that uh, we had to stop. We'll have some other things that we'll get into tomorrow because I know we had a full show. But appreciate each and every one of you listening in and watching into the John Neighbors show. Be sure to like and subscribe to the show. Like and subscribe to United States Sports. Going to have a lot of great stuff going on. Throughout this week, football, basketball, baseball, we're going to be on top of it here at United States Sports. So can't wait to get back after it tomorrow. Same sports show, same sports channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great rest of your night, everybody. We'll see you then.